one of the things I think happens when a child turns five is a parent starts looking at them differently and starts saying like, oh, these behaviors are sort of not going away, or we thought they would grow out of them, or now it's time for them to go to school. And so the expectations of independence and autonomy, the expectation of being able to manage emotions, parents shift and begin to get a little more worried when they're five. We'll have one question about sort of bathroom stuff. And that's a time when we begin to expect that kids are going to be able to move to a different phase. And I think that's why five becomes the time when parents start to panic about, you know, oh, gosh, these problems or these issues have been here all along. And I thought they would grow out of them. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a fluster clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Hi, Robin. Hey, Lynn, I saw that one of the families who participated in one of the in-session episodes reached out to you with some follow-up. So let's hear about that before we get into the episode. Yeah. So an in-session episode, just so everybody knows, is when a family volunteers, a parent reaches out to me. You can do that on the website. And they get a consultation with me. They present a problem and I offer solutions. So it is a great way to hear how I interact with families. It's a great way to hear how I do consultations. Yeah. So it's really cool. So this family, this mom contacted me and the issue that this mom presented was that she had a daughter, a little girl who had type one diabetes, who was having a lot of anxiety and was vomiting, which if you have type one diabetes, Vomiting in that way is really dangerous. Yeah. I mean, that's truly the right word to use, dangerous. And so I told her what to do and we talked about it and came up with a plan. And then she emailed me recently as a follow-up and I asked her if I could share her follow-up. It demonstrates to me, it illustrates to me how possible it is as a family to shift things and make things better. It's a very optimistic email. And I think that a little optimism right now is a good thing. So here's what this mom said. Her daughter's name was Lily. Lily graduated from her therapy and simultaneously got a new insulin pump and hasn't had an anxiety throw up episode in four months. A few interesting things to note from a clinical perspective, we realized that she connected nausea and anxiety regardless of which came first. And with diabetes, that made things very difficult. The new insulin pump she is using regulates her insulin automatically. She doesn't need juice boxes in the middle of the night. And we believe the acidity of the nighttime low blood sugar juice boxes made her nauseous in the morning. And she thought she was anxious even when there was nothing she could pinpoint being anxious about. So as a little aside, this is often what happens when somebody is having a physical symptom And you have to be careful about trying to figure out what is it that's making you anxious? What's the source of this? What's the root cause of this? This poor little girl was feeling anxious because she was feeling nauseous and she had type 1 diabetes. Very confusing for her little brain and her little body. But because of the emotional management we've been working on, now that the diabetes variable has been removed from the equation, she is now responding appropriately to her worries, acknowledging them and working through them. Our entire family is learning emotional management with her. I truly believe my younger boys are going to be emotionally healthier because of this entire experience. My girl is beginning to understand her body better. Because she has more confidence in her safety with her new pump, she's so much more independent and her problem solving and flexibility skills are growing by the day. She's proof that children aren't doomed to a life of anxiety or a life defined by a diagnosis. They can adapt and change their thinking patterns when everyone works together to learn skills of emotional management. Huge, huge progress. We're so proud of her. So thankful for your guidance and that you use this platform to help families. Thank you so much from this mom who's continuing to grow from your knowledge and experience too. I just wanted to share that with Elise's permission because 
if you listen to what she's saying, she's talking about ongoing work as a family to develop emotional management, to develop flexibility, to support independence. She also said her daughter is thinking of going away on this school trip without her, which was a big deal because there was a lot of separation stuff going on. And now I just want to sort of offer this as a concrete piece of evidence that this stuff, when you do it with your family consistently, it absolutely works. Yeah, regardless of the circumstance, any family, when they're working together on their emotional responses to things, any challenges they face. I mean, I know in that episode, we talked a lot about families who also deal with other chronic health conditions and how parents can get naturally, right? They're so ramped up because dealing with your children's health is incredibly stressful. It's a breeding ground for being very anxious. Correct. No one would judge you for being anxious when you're dealing with chronic health issues. Right. And the thing that's interesting too, is we just want to recognize that sometimes the chronic health issues cause the anxiety, like that's absolutely the source of the anxiety. And sometimes you go into it, and this mom will say this, they go into it sort of with an anxious way of managing the world. And then along comes this chronic illness to absolutely ramp things up. A really great example of the interplay of these two things and how tricky they can be and how you can figure them out. I just want to re-emphasize the optimistic message here for all of our listeners, because I've learned from you positive expectancy, the belief that things can change. And we probably have some listeners where the emotional management and regulation in the family isn't very strong right now. Everyone reacts, has big emotions, feels a little disconnected from the big emotions. But with practice, you can really change a family. You can. Yeah, you really can. And the positive expectancy message is so important now because as I talk about a lot, I was just at a huge psychotherapy conference and we were talking about this. The other presenters and I were talking about this. Is this message of permanence, this message that this is who you are, this message that things aren't going to change is pretty pervasive right now. So we just got to keep making sure that we're working those pathways of change and malleability and possibility. So, so important right now. So today we have several listener questions that have sort of piled up in the Facebook group that we're going to address. And quite funny, they're all about five-year-olds. So (laughs) I think before we get into that, Lynn, is there something about the age of five in that developmental place that certain patterns, certain behaviors start becoming more solid? Well, so if you look at what happens when you're five, right? So a lot of times that's when kids start going to school. It's a lot of times when there are expectations of independence, right? You know, do you remember when your kids turned five, you feel like, oh, they're not a baby anymore. There feels like such a big difference between four and five, you know? Oh, And so I think that's when parents begin to notice or begin to pay attention. Maybe this child isn't moving in into a more independent phase as they should. So one of the things I think happens when a child turns five is a parent starts looking at them differently and starts saying like, oh, these behaviors are sort of not going away, or we thought they would grow out of them, or now it's time for them to go to school. So the expectations of independence and autonomy, the expectation of being able to manage emotions, parents shift and begin to get a little more worried when they're five. We'll have one question about bathroom stuff. And that's a time when we begin to expect that kids are going to be able to move to a different phase. And I think that's why five becomes the time when parents start to panic about, oh gosh, these problems or these issues have been here all along. And I thought they would grow out of them. That's what a lot of people say. Well, she'll grow out of it. And then you hit five and they're like, oh, they're not. So I think that's why we hear from a lot of parents with five-year-olds. Got it. Well, when we come back, we've got a five-year-old with big emotions. We've got a five-year-old with perfectionistic issues. And then we have a five-year-old who is getting some conflicting, and I'm going to say this because I'm not a therapist, some pretty darn wacky advice from a therapist. (laughs) And I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Okay. Okay. Hey, Robin, how many trips do you take a month? I would say on average, I take 
two to three trips a month. Okay. I'm on the road a lot. Yeah. Tell you how psyched I was that my favorite luggage company decided to be a sponsor of this Fluster Clucks episode. By coincidence, it was like the universe made me so happy. So Base Luggage and Bags reached out to us because they have a new line of diaper bags and they are just as fabulous as the luggage that I carry. It's sort of like the Mary Poppins endless carpet bag of where is your stuff and how do you find it? Having a great bag to take with you when you travel, it just, it eliminates one huge stress. Well, that's what's so great is that they took all of the clever design that they put in their luggage and their bags, and then they've made this new diaper bag with equal intelligence. It's got a non-diaper bag look, which I love. Even my husband has actually carried it. And it's also for parents got all these extra added features that make you feel like a rock star in those moments. You can change your baby on an included changing pad, even has a teething ring. And I love this. It has a little pacifier holder that you can attach to the outside of the bag, but keep it in a safe place. I'm just observing the way that families are trying to travel through airports and anything that can make it easier for them and more efficient and that also looks good, I think is something that we can get behind. That's why diaper bags and the luggage at BASE are worthy of every parent's journey. BASE is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting beistravel.com slash fluster. So go to travel.com slash fluster. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash fluster. Fluster, and you're going to get 15% off your first purchase. Hey, everybody. This is Robin at Fluster Clocks. When Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's LuxRecess.com. L-U-X-E-R-E-C-E-S-S.com. Okay, we're back. Okay, Lynn, this is our first five-year-old. And I think a lot of these we're going to think about. Every parent always says, like, I just wish I knew what to say. When you say it and your presentations are in the books, it makes so much sense. But I just wish I had you in my pocket. Okay, and let me say this too. So these are about five-year-olds. So if you're listening and you don't have a five-year-old, this will be relevant to you. And also don't be thinking, okay, so this person had a problem with a five-year-old but my child is seven, so it must be different. Don't do that, right? If I teach you how to ride the red bike, you'll also know how to ride the blue bike. Amen. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. After listening to the episode about teaching your kids how to handle disappointment, I had a question. I have a five-year-old who has big emotions in general and definitely with disappointment. I also have a three-year-old who's mostly go with the flow. He's constantly exposed to his sister's big explosions of feelings and tantrums, and I know it upsets him as he's told me. It's scary when she screams. I also know you shouldn't leave a tantruming child as that can feel shaming or like rejection. So my question is, how do I make sure that I'm supporting both of their experiences? Can I tell my exploding child that I'll be in her brother's room reading with him while she calms down? It generally seems to upset her more. Or do I leave her brother alone in another space and stay with her? I'm generally the main caregiver and I'm with them on my own. Yeah. Okay. So this is a really common question. What do you do with the other kids when one child is falling apart, when one child is tantruming, when one child is freaking out? This is also a good example of, in general, how an anxious child or even an anxious adult, right? One of the anxious parents sort of starts to dictate what other people in the family have to do. I like this question because the mom is saying, I don't want this five-year-old's difficulty with her big emotions. I don't want them to dictate how we run the house. I don't want to say to my three-year-old, you have to tolerate your sister's big explosions because they're in charge of the house. So the questions that this mom is asking are just really, really astute and really on target. Here's what I would do. I would have a conversation with the five-year-old 
about her big emotions. When she's not having them. Correct. When she's not having them. So we really want to work on those skills of emotional management. I would recommend going online. You can go online and they have all sorts of drawings and there are kids books about handling big emotions. This is generally when kids are having these big emotions, like you say, definitely with disappointment. This is an issue of rigidity. This is an issue of I expected things to go a certain way and now they're not going that way and I don't know how to manage them in contrast to the three-year-old who's sort of like, yeah, okay, I can go with the flow. Have a conversation with your five-year-old about her big emotions, work on helping her put words to her big emotions, and talk to her about being a piece of cooked spaghetti. So use that analogy that I use all the time, get a box of spaghetti, take out that uncooked piece of spaghetti, have her try and tie it in a knot. It's going to fall apart. You can give a piece of uncooked spaghetti to your three-year-old too. He'll like to break it into pieces. And talk to her about as a family, we are working on handling big emotions. You want to practice having her talk about and be able to put words to when things don't go the way that they were supposed to, how do you handle it? You got to do all that front loading so that when the situation happens, when something doesn't go her way and she has these big emotions, you don't have to explain all this to her. You can say, I need you now to work on being a piece of cooked spaghetti. You can also say, I get it right now that you're very disappointed, but I need us to work together on you being able to bring down the big reactions that you're having. The Not the big emotions. It's okay that you have the big emotions, but I need you to work on your behavior or your responses right now. And then ahead of time, do this ahead of time, say to her, how are we going together? How are we going to handle these big reactions when they show up? And give her some options. She can go to her room by herself and read a book. Maybe she's going to run around the house and burn off some energy. Maybe there's some music, you put music on, you dance together. So it can be a connecting experience. You're not abandoning her. You're not sending her away. She may very well say, I want to go off by myself. But what you want to be clear with her is that when she is screaming and yelling, that is impacting the rest of the family and impacting her. So we're going to work on her handling those big emotions. You could say to her, what if the neighbors had a dog and the dog stood outside our door or outside of our window, and just went over and over and over again. And we had to figure out what to do with this dog's big, loud barking. We have to figure out how you can learn to manage these emotions better, handle these big feelings, which you're allowed to have, but not in a way that makes the whole house have to deal with this part of you that's screaming and yelling. That's what you have to talk about with her ahead of time. Now, then it's going to happen. And she's going to freak out and she's going to scream and yell. And you can say to her, this is a situation in which we're working on you handling your big emotions. How can I help right now? And if she says, you can't help, right? You say, so we're working on handling these big emotions. Now, maybe you have a list of three things that you're going to do. You're going to take some deep breaths. She's going to go get a book, something. You've got to put that in place ahead of time. What you say to the three-year-old while this is going on is you say to the three-year-old, I don't know what the girl's name is. So look, Mary is having some big emotions, isn't she? So right now, I am working with Mary to help her handle her big emotions. So we're going to give her some space or I'm going to read a book with her, but we're working on handling big emotions. So you are modeling for your son that this is a process to learn and you are not saying to him, oh, she shouldn't respond that way, or oh, this is terrible, or oh, she's going to be punished. You're letting him know this is a process, but we are not going to let her big emotions run the house. That's the message that you want to give her and the message that you want to give your son. My question about that when I read it was, if you want to always remove the three-year-old who's a little more emotionally flexible, if you're always trying to remove him, that's sort of to me is like eliminating that uncomfortable experience for him. So it's like honoring what is the balance between letting him see the work being modeled, letting the work be connective versus like honoring his own space and his experience too. Like, how do you do the both? Yeah. And you can ask him, you can say to him, when your sister is screaming and yelling, you can go to this other place. 
you could give him headphones and listen to music. I wouldn't plop him in front of a screen because I don't feel like that's a great coping strategy. But you're thinking about what you're modeling for both of them. And what you don't want to do, the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to scoot the three-year-old away as if to say, this terrible thing is happening over here and you can't handle it, right? So like, oh, you better go to the bedroom. Like, run away. Your sister's freaking out again. But we want him to hear. We want this three-year-old to hear and to see you saying you are learning to handle your big emotions and this is not how we're going to continue to do it. I'm going to help you because then you're modeling for the three-year-old too. You're giving him all of that language. Even though he's go with the flow, this is a skill he needs too. So you may offer him, you know, you can go here. We're going to have you go over here while I deal with your sister. It's tough because you're right. You're alone in this, but we don't want to sort of scurry him off as if this is something he can't see. Oh, this is something he can't handle. And you can acknowledge to him, like, I know this is really hard to hear your sister screaming. We're working on it. I had more of a, my firstborn was pretty easygoing. My son had a period where he seemed a little more rigid. And if I could go back in time now and I were to handle this, you give me feedback, but this is like an idea that I have if I had to do this. Okay. So I would front load the conversation with the more rigid child, but include both of them and say, you know what? The goal is you can't tie a knot or you can't make a heart in the shape of with uncooked spaghetti. Right. Right. But like if we're flexible, anything is possible. We can tie a knot. We can make a heart. We could make a a beach ball, you know? So it's like, we all want to be flexible. So the next time you show that you're being uncooked spaghetti, we're going to, as a family, work on the path of cooked spaghetti. Mm -hmm. In order to cook spaghetti, you have to make it warm. So I think hugs are really great of like making you warm and toasty. And then that way we can help make your cook your spaghetti a little bit. So the reason why I bring that in, because I think with little kids, physical touch can be so important. So then when the daughter in this circumstance is like kind of freaking out, it's like, oh, I see that you're having a really hard time with this. And I think maybe we should all try and go down the path of cooked spaghetti together. So first you say, how can we help you? Right. But then say, like, I'd like to make you warm if you'd like, you know, give them the choice. Can I give you a good, tight, warm hug first to see if we can get a little bend out of this? Gamify it, play with it a little bit. And then what I like about, and this is where I'm headed, is that then you can say that also to the three-year-old who's then brought into the process. Can I help cook your spaghetti a little bit with a warm hug too? So that then everyone's kind of remaining connective. And obviously, if a kid's like being violent, and then that's a little bit different, but it's about keeping the conversation. Correct. And sometimes you may say, would you like a hug now? Can I warm you up? Right. I love that. And she may say like, no. Right? <laughs> so, and that's okay, too. And here's the other thing, too, as you're saying this, just as a reminder, we are not going to put the three-year-old in the position of helping the five-year-old. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're not going to say to the little brother, can you help your sister? Can you go give your sister a hug? Right. Because that's not his job. So you want him to be a spectator. You know, if he wants to go away, let him go away. He may say like, oh, I've had enough of this. So he can be the audience if he chooses to. But just be careful not to say to the little three-year-old, do you want to help your sister? And also be careful to not say, look at your brother. He handles this so well. Right. Never compare like that. Yep. But I love the idea of sort of connection. And you're saying, I'm going to offer you a hug. There are certain times when kids get so emotionally dysregulated, they can't bring it back on their own. And I think this mom says, you know, I don't want to send her away because that feels like rejection or shaming. And that's true. We don't want to send her away. She's a little tiny person. So we want to give the skills. And remember also the key thing during these situations, talk 85% less. So say what you need to say, keep it succinct. That's why the front loading is so important. You're not explaining the principles when she's in the middle of the tantrum. You're just reminding her what the plan is and then be quiet and give her a chance to respond. And if she screams for another minute and then she responds, it, that's okay. Just don't get into big talky, talky, talky. Let's do this. Blah, 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 right? You've got to slow your pace down. You've got to emotionally regulate yourself. You've got to be a model for how we're going to move through this. I mean, that's a lot to think about in the moment. Front load it. And you may even, mom, this mom may even write a note for herself that has like the three key points that she wants to hit. So it's right there in front of her. So when her daughter's screaming, she's like, okay, I have to remember, I'm going to do this, this, and this. 
We want to keep it simple. Yeah. I'm just thinking with little, little kids, it's you've got the hug, which is helping warm up. And then you can blow bubbles to boil the water. You know, that kind of thing. Yep. And then it's like you do it once or twice. And then you let them be. But there's a physical thing for them to do. Yeah. When little kids, if this was a three-year-old or a two-year-old who was having these kinds of things, we wouldn't be using verbal stuff as much. We would be using much more presence and touch and connection. I used to say to my younger son when he would have a temper tantrum, I'm going to stand right here. The answer is going to be no. And I'm going to stand right here because I see you're having a rough time. And when you want me to give you a hug and then you sit there and you wait. And when they slow down, when you see them take a breath in, (gasps) right, that's a sign that they're working on regulating their system, right? So you see that. And then you go in and you offer comfort. We never want to say you have to handle this on your own or I'm going to put you in your room by yourself or that kind of stuff. Sometimes I used to say as my kids got a little older, I'd say, so you're having a really rough time now. And so if you would like to go somewhere in the house where you can have a little alone time, you get to pick that. I wouldn't put them in time out, but I would say if there's somewhere in the house you can go, which, you know, in my head was like, and not in front of me, if there's somewhere in the house you can go, I want you to go there and let me know if you need me, but I want you to work on, right? So as I got a little older, I would do that. And five, you know, we're getting to that point where she may want a little bit more independence as she's working through this. Great. Well, this next five-year-old has some perfectionism issues. I'd like to read this one to you now. Okay. My very smart, active five-year-old has a lot of school-based stress and anxiety. He's currently in a very structured private school pre-K program, which has just magnified his anxiety. He breaks down and refuses to participate if he's not perfect because school and teachers expect him to be perfect all the time. His words paraphrased. He's also classified as gifted in his verbal skills and verbal reasoning. And we're searching for a school environment for kindergarten that will meet him where he's at, especially with working with his anxiety and that will allow him to learn at his best, not punishing him if he wants to talk through his work and ask questions. We've enrolled him at a small Montessori school for the fall, but we're afraid that this will not offer enough structure for him. Any suggestions or experiences to share? It has been such a struggle for our family to find a daycare and now school environment that will work for and with our son. Okay. So here's the thing. You're looking for the perfect program. Okay. So you've got a child who's demonstrating some rigidity and some perfectionism, and you're trying to find the perfect fit. Okay. So just think about that for a minute, right? No school environment is going to be perfect. So he's in a program now that feels like it's too stressful. You said a private school pre-K program, which is very, it sounds structured and demanding. You're worried that the Montessori program is going to be too unstructured and not demanding enough. And you're really trying to find the program that will fit your child's needs perfectly. It doesn't exist. The Goldilocks issue. Correct. Right. So what you want to think about, because right now this is where people are focusing on the perfectionism as an external problem rather than an internal problem. And what you want to focus on with your little guy here is how is he going to manage in circumstances that aren't perfect for him? Now, if you put a child in a school and you're like, oh, this is a terrible fit. These teachers don't really get my kid. And when I have conversations with my kid, they're not really understanding him. They're not flexible at all. Then that's a problem too, right? Because now we've got rigidity meeting rigidity. So there's a whole lot of rigidity here. And also parenthetically, my kids went to a Montessori school when they were little. It was an amazing place that had a few really great teachers and one really lousy teacher. I didn't care if it was a Montessori school. The one teacher didn't know what she was doing with my kid. And that made the situation with my child. It was the interaction with the teacher. So Montessori programs are actually not a free for all. When you say it's unstructured, the Montessori program, if it's truly a Montessori program, is pretty amazing at doing what we call the proximal level of development, which means that they offer challenges to your child that are just a little bit out of reach. And then your child independently moves into those challenges. It is a really great environment to foster independence. Maria Montessori said, don't do for a child what a child can do for him or herself. So I wouldn't see the Montessori program as just sort of like, yay, we're going to let our kids do whatever we want. It's really a very 
incredibly powerful model of education. So if you can find a good Montessori program with great teachers, that can be a good option for him. So you and I both sent our kids to Montessori. And this is something that I observed as a Montessori parent. This family's kind of talking about or thinking of through an achievement lens, their son's capability. And I would say that while we also had some really early verbal talkers in our family wide as well, I would say be really open and flexible to where Montessori will highlight so many emotional skills that can be developed where your son, frankly, might be a beginner. He may be very practiced in certain things and be really a beginner in other emotional skills that Montessori teaches. And that I think is so wonderful about what Montessori actually can be. Yeah, it's a really socially based approach to kids developing all of these fabulous emotional skills, like you say. I'm glad you pointed that out, Robin, because I feel like with this situation, if a five-year-old says, or if you report that a five-year-old says, he refuses to participate if he's not perfect because school and teachers expect him to be perfect all the time, that's an inside problem. That's not the teachers. That's not the teachers. You really want to pay attention to what's an environment in which you're going to have good teachers that understand development and, like you say, are working on flexibility, working on connection, working on emotional skills. I don't think the problem here or I don't think the goal here is to find the perfect school to help your perfectionistic gifted child. I think the goal is to recognize you've got a child who's very bright and very verbal and also is showing some real early signs of rigidity, what is a program that's going to teach him the skills that he needs rather than accommodate what you see as his giftedness in a way that is only going to become more and more rigid as time goes on? Yes. The other thing is that in Montessori, I think you probably have great statistics to back up that emotional skills will particularly serve those who have intellectual gifts far more than an intellectual who has no emotional skills. I think we can all agree with that. And if this is a household where you're recognizing their intellectual gifts or maybe intellectual achievement is really revered and honored, take a break from that for a little while and focus on developing emotional skills until like eighth grade. (laughs) And it would be a very different experience for the child if his emotional skills, if he tells that the emotional skills are the priority. Yeah. The thing about this, what the mom says is that he's refusing to participate if he is not perfect. That's what you want to pay attention to. We have a perfectionistic episode actually where you unpack this for the full episode, which would be a good thing to listen to. Yeah. Okay. So in sum, what Robin and I both agree on is that for a five-year-old who's showing intellectual gifts and also a rigid perfectionism, you really want to, as it used to say in my gym, you really want to work the weak parts, which this isn't really the weak part. I'm going to say we want to work the essential parts. We want to make sure that the underdeveloped parts of any child get attention. At the age of five, academic focus doesn't help develop these really key skills. And interestingly, when we look at the skills of executive functioning, two of the things that in early years are critical are reading for pleasure and unstructured play. So we really want to pay attention to making sure that he's having exposure to all of those different experiences. But the fact that he's refusing to participate if he's not perfect, or also then what happens is if the teachers aren't perfect, that's going to be a problem. And so I really want to make sure that you are not trying to address his perfectionism with your perfectionism. We want to find a school that develops these really important social and emotional skills. So when we come back, we have a five-year-old who's in a play therapy experience that, frankly, I'm kind of excited to hear what Lynn has to say. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so 
So now back to the show. So we're back in this final one I saved for last because I know my sister-in-law <laughs> <laughs> and I'm waiting for this one. Okay. So we just started play therapy with my five-year-old daughter. The content of why we started therapy is due to her fear and anxiety over using the bathroom and having many accidents throughout the day. I have so many questions after doing, in quotes, special play time during our play therapy session. The therapist told me that the rules were that the mom couldn't ask any questions and couldn't give any direction for 15 minutes of special play time. My daughter wanted to play spot it, but didn't know how, nor did I. And since I couldn't tell her how to play or read the direction, she got pissed and threw the cards on the floor. Couldn't give her directions to pick up the cards or to try a different game. And so we had 15 minutes of being pissed off. And the therapist told me to tell my daughter, I see that you're mad, which of course pissed her off even more. I don't feel like this was the point of special playtime. I think I'm missing something. And I asked the therapist about this and she said that I should notice how many times I wanted to ask her a question or give her direction and think about that over the week. So here I am thinking, I don't get why we needed my daughter pissed off for 15 minutes. What am I missing? Okay, let me just take a breath. So when I read this question... Um, I had a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings. The thing that most jumped out at me about this is there's a mom who's trying to figure out how to help her daughter. And even when she asks the therapist, what am I trying to teach here? What's the purpose of this? The therapist says the really annoying thing of, I want you to think about that for a week, which to me is... Not helpful when somebody says, can you explain to me what the purpose of this exercise is? The therapist should be able to say right then and there, here's the skill that I'm trying to develop. Here's what I noticed about your relationship. And by doing this exercise, I wanted to show you blank or I wanted to show your daughter blank. Having them play a game in which a daughter is not allowed to ask any questions about a game that she doesn't know how to play and a mom isn't allowed to answer any questions about a game that she doesn't know how to play, doesn't sound like A, a normal human interaction, right? That just sounds mean. And also, I'm not quite sure at all how this is relevant to the problem that they went to therapy for, which is that the daughter is having bathroom issues and having accidents during the day. Can we cut to the chase? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this being an overarching thing of like, is this therapy the right thing? The mom has questions. Yeah. Many parents do. Why don't you address that? Okay. Because this mom should leave. (laughs) I know. And she did say that you didn't. The last line of the question, which you left out was, am I supposed to learn something from what happened or should I just run away from this therapist? Okay. So let me say this too. Play therapy is incredibly helpful and powerful in a lot of circumstances, particularly play is the way that children process trauma. So when you are working with a really skilled and knowledgeable play therapist who is helping a child process trauma, it is remarkable to watch these skilled therapists at work. And it is creative. It is connected. It is metaphorical. It's like watching Mr. Rogers teaching kids these huge, important lessons through the metaphors of the things that he does. Play is incredibly powerful. So I am all for really skilled play therapy. I don't know what the heck this therapist was trying to do. I don't. I have never heard. Now, again, I am not by training a play therapist. I've never heard an exercise where you have a daughter and a mother, particularly where the daughter is there for because she needs to some skills to figure out how to deal with her anxiety over using the potty, that they play a game and get pissed off at each other. I've never heard a therapist say that you should sit here for 15 minutes, call it special playtime, and then not be able to interact with your daughter, not be able to ask questions. Now, suppose the therapist was saying, you know what, I see that you're kind of controlling, mom. I see that you are really sort of over managing things. I see that you're too intrusive, et cetera, et cetera. Then tell the mom that and give the mom some concrete instructions. But to just offer this and to let this poor little five-year-old try and figure out what the heck is going on, I don't get it. I truly don't get it. Here's the other thing. If you have a child who comes to you and the presenting problem, as we say in the biz, is that she's having trouble toileting, that she's having many accidents during the day, That can be indicative of some pretty serious issues that you want to address. And there has to be 
very direct questions about what's going on. Is this child constipated? Are they withholding? Do we have an issue with encopresis, which means that children are withholding their bowels and they're not pooping and so they get constipated? It causes long and chronic difficulty. If you have a child who's afraid to pee on the potty, I would want to be very clear and very direct about what are the skills that we need to teach this child, maybe what are the skills that we need to teach this mom and daughter together so that they can move through whatever this anxiety is about in terms of using the bathroom. You have to address the problem that's presented. And I don't know, I don't even know what the game, what's the game called? Spot it. I don't know what that game is. Playing a game can be a wonderful thing to do in therapy, but there is no discussion There is no direct instruction. There is no saying to these families, what happens when she needs to go to the potty? What are the things that you've tried? And let's figure out what we have to do in order to address the toileting issue. There are people who specialize in this. There are people who know how to handle it. This is not an uncommon issue. I have no idea what this therapist is doing. The message that I have to all of you is that if you are in therapy with somebody, with your child, and what the therapist is doing makes no sense, that you're not getting your questions answered, that when you ask a direct question, the therapist says, well, that's for me to know and you to find out, run. Because that's not what this experience should be. You should go to a therapy session with your child, particularly if you're just getting to know this therapist, if you're trying to figure out what's going on, And you should leave the therapy session feeling better equipped to handle the problem at hand than you did when you went in. This poor mom felt so confused. She had the exact opposite experience. She had no idea what this was about. She doesn't have any homework of what she's supposed to deal with with the child. Her homework was to pay attention to how many times she wants to ask questions to her daughter. How is that connected to a daughter who's afraid to go to the potty and who's having accidents? Right. Just really like all of my like, what the heck is going on here? Buttons were pushed by this question. To make it worse, there's a book out now by someone commenting on international parenting styles. I just listened to a podcast talking to this author and the author talked about how in the United States, the number of times per hour we give an order or modify what our child is doing is significantly higher than in other countries. So when I read that too, I thought, oh my gosh, is this therapist just like read that book and is now like conducting her own experiments or something with her clients? I mean, I don't know. But anyway, I just thought like, well, it's like, well, that's uh, she read this. So she's now doing that. Yeah. But say that that's a real problem. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, say she's noticing that this mom is really anxious or this mom is really intrusive or this mom is really giving a lot of demands and that kind of stuff. Talk directly to the mom about how to interrupt that pattern. Right. And that is an anxious pattern, too, for anxious parents to talk too much. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps the therapist, if we say, okay, let's give the therapist the benefit of the doubt. And she really, in talking to this mom, was really getting a vibe, was really getting a feeling that this mom is too controlling or this mom is too anxious or this mom is too directive. Talk directly to the mom about that. Don't set up this game in which nobody knows what's going on. The poor little girl is sort of being subjected to this weird interaction with her mom that doesn't feel good. The therapist, it is really important, in my humble opinion, to be very clear, compassionate, empathic, and direct when parents are trying to change a pattern or understand a problem. To be obscure like this, to sort of, you know, say, well, I'm not going to really tell you what I'm doing, is what gives therapists a bad name. It makes it much more difficult for a parent to be honest and open about what's going on. Because to me, this experience feels like it was very shaming to this mom, right? It was a very shaming experience. That's not how you should feel when you leave a therapy session with your five-year-old daughter. You shouldn't feel shamed and confused and that it's your job to figure out what the heck the therapist was doing. It should be clear. It should be concrete. It should be delivered in a way that makes sense. And the questions that the parents asked should be answered directly. Giving the benefit of the doubt that this therapist had a goal of disrupting that talkative pattern with the mom, it was a huge misfire. And therefore, the therapist doesn't sound very skilled and worth 
patronizing again. If I had this experience with a therapist and the issue is the toileting stuff and this is what the intervention was, I wouldn't go back. There's no plan. Say this mom says, look, she has trouble. She's not using the toilet. She's having accidents. If a family came in to me to talk about that, I would want to first ask a lot of questions to figure out sort of what the patterns were and what was going on. And then I would want that family to leave saying, oh, phew, okay, Lynn understands this. This is not an unusual problem. I feel so much better that we are talking to somebody who gets this. And these are the things that we're going to do very concretely over the next few weeks. And then we're going to go back and see Lynn and Lynn is going to help us figure out what worked and what didn't and how we can modify this. I don't get the sense that that happened at all with this. And I think this mom left feeling rightfully so confused, a little shamed, a little frustrated. And the poor little girl left pissed off. Does this little girl want to go back to therapy after she had that experience with her mom? Why would you want to have a therapeutic experience where the little girl just feels more pissed off at her mom by the end of the session? I don't see the benefit of that. This reminds me, I was on a plane this weekend. And as we landed, a very comedic flight attendant said, Well, we've just landed back in Boston and congratulations, this was the first flight of our crew. (laughs) So it was a joke and everyone laughed, but it's almost like I keep thinking like that was the first play session for that therapist. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe not, sadly. Maybe she's, I don't know. I was on a plane once and the flight attendant said, everyone, I just want to let you know we're celebrating a birthday today. We have a man on the plane who is celebrating his 91st birthday and this was his first flight. So give a high five to the captain on the way off the airplane because he did a great job. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because what he said, this is he's 91 years old and it's his first flight and everybody went, oh, right. And then she said that. We all laughed. Ha ah, ha. It was a good one. Yeah. yeah. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.